Welcome back to our series on data handling in R. I'm Mark Ledbetter, and this is lecture video five. In all of our code, we should probably start off with this line to clear our environment. It's very easy to have old objects left over from previous programs, and I often use the same names over again. And so if I forget to define something, and I've used it before, then it might be there, and I get errors. So it's safe to safer to run this code and clear everything out. Now, the default for R is to print out 1,000 lines of code in the console. Control-L clears the console. I want you to change the options, for this, this time at least, to 10,000. Okay, so we have something where you're going to need that in order to see everything that we're printing out. If you don't have that, then you won't see everything. You'll say this many rows are not printed. Okay, so again, we're talking about basics in this uh, video, <clears throat> and you might wonder why we didn't do basics to start with. I was taught with basics first, these basics. And it was overwhelming because I didn't know anything about R. I hadn't been in there. It didn't make any sense. It's just a lot of tedious information. Whereas now you have had some experience in R. You've uh, used things, vectors, matrices, lists, etc. So now I'm hoping that this information will make a lot more sense to you. Okay. I based this lesson on this file or part of this file. So um, I want you to uh, type this into your code along so that you'll have it for later if you ever want it. And so I can come to here, paste, and this is the file. It's older, um, and it's by Ohio State University, okay? But, and it's mainly talking about the R GUI, okay? The R GUI here which, of course, we're not going to use. We're going to use something much better, which is our studio. But originally, this is all they had. So a lot of these techniques um, required, uh, I mean, they were important back then. Now they're not so important. Some of these are not so important. Some are very important still. So let's jump in. Getting help. This was the biggest thing. You know, you, you need to know how to get help so that you can be effective and, and actually get things done. So we want to get help on the standard deviation. Okay, it's a function. So if I'm in the R GUI, then I can use help SD. And what it does is it takes me to my web browser and finds the documentation on the function standard deviation. Now, this line here is extremely important. SD is the function, and stats is the package that it's in. So you go out to um, the internet, you search for a certain function in R that will do what you want to do, you find the documentation, you need to know which package it's in so that you can install that package, load that package, and use that function. If you don't know what package it's in, there's no way you can use that function. So this is really important. Okay. So um, the, the help files for R are very important. Okay. Another way to do exactly the same thing is this code, question mark and then the function. And you'll notice that there's two tabs here. They're both exactly identical, except I've selected one, not the other. Okay. But in our studio, all I need to do is come over to this tab and I type in S D, and then I select the right one. And here it is, the same exact documentation. So instead of going to the web page, our studio brings the web page to me and you. So that's really nice. Okay, so the help tab uh, on the right, lower right panel. 
Now, let's say I want to see the code that's used to calculate the function SD. Obviously, that's not in the help file here. N nothing about that. So what I can do is I can come down here to the console and type the name of the function, not the parentheses, nothing else, just the name of the function. Hit Enter. And the first thing it does is it tells me the structure of the function. That's exactly the same thing over here in the help file. Then it tells me how it's calculated here. Okay? So that tells me the code that's used to calculate. All right, so that's how we find out uh, about the function specifics. There's another way to do that. Now, if I want to do an exhaustive search on SD, oh, and by the way, uh, yeah, so I already told you that running these codes over here uh, puts the result here. Now, if I want to do an exhaustive function uh, search on SD, not just the standard deviation function, but anything to do with standard deviation, I say help.search in quotations. That's important. You have to have these quotations here, SD. And when I run that over here, I get lots of information about this. So these are vignettes. This is code demonstrations. Um, these are help pages. And what you'll see is here is effect size SD pooled. Here is an SD, capital SD function for this package called DSC tools, desk tools. Okay? It's a weighted standard deviation. So this is very exhaustive about SD. All right? In case that you're not just looking for um, that one particular uh, function you want to know about standard deviations. Okay. What if I want to know about, um, oh, and if again, if I want to know about this, the function help.search, question mark help.search, or just come over here and type in help.search, and it'll bring you to the uh, help page for that. And that's in the utils um, package. Okay. What if I want to know about these double brackets? So this is a feature. This is not a function. This is a feature. Well, <clears throat> if I'm going to do this from the console or from code, I need to put them in quotation marks here inside the help function. Okay. But in our studio, I can really just come over here and type in the double brackets and then select just the double brackets down here. And here is uh, the information on extracting or replacing parts of an object. And here's a single bracket, here's the double bracket, and some examples, and then the, the help information. Okay. Uh, again, there's something called a function. If I wanted to create my own function, I type in function, and it brings me the function definition. Now, notice that there's something called function class. And these are classes to basic data types. So this is some information, uh, some general information um, that's good to have. Okay, so, um, so there are some topics here um, that aren't about functions, but they're about other things. So about R. So it is in there. It's just not always easy to find. Sometimes it's easier to go out to the Internet and do a search in your search engine of choice for the information and, and find it. Okay. So this is in the base package, and it's how to define our own functions, and we will talk about this a little later. Okay. So that's help. Now let's talk about packages. I've mentioned packages. Now, packages are something that can be created by anyone who can figure out how to, and then it's deployed. Now here's the thing. Nobody checks these packages, so it's important if I use a new package, I'm usually going to do the calculations one way and know that I have the right answer and then check it in that package to make sure the author didn't make a mistake. Okay? You say, well, that's why isn't it checked? Well, because it's free. R is free, and R Studio is free as well. So that's the 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 um, handoff here or the um, the cost is that you don't always know that the packages are correct, but most people take great pains to make sure that their packages don't have errors. But every now and then, somebody will find an error and tell the author, and they'll fix it. Okay? Okay.
So the base installation of R has a lot of things, but nowhere near what we need. So that's why these other people uh, have created these nice packages for us to use. Before we can use a package or a function within a package, we have to first install the package on our machine, and then we have to load the package. If we don't do both of those, we can't use the functions that are inside that package. Okay? So let's say, for example, we want to install and load the, the uh, car package. Now, our studio has a tab over here, Packages. And it's taking a second. Okay. Oh, not that. I'm running out of memory. I've used, I've, I've done this so many times. Oh, that's what's wrong. Sorry. I had something typed. All right. So um, I'm going to uninstall this. Yeah. Because I want to show what happened. I want to install the package. Not in uninstall. I unloaded it. Okay, so it was loaded. It's installed here. And it tells me what version. Uh, but I could I could say that pretend that I didn't have it uh, installed and I can reinstall it. Okay. So if I want to know about the car, the exhaustive search about car, um, I do this and it brings me here uh, using car functions inside, user functions, all this stuff. But I still don't see the package documentation for the car package. So what we want to do is we want to search for car package documentation. You want this. So here is the package name. That's the only thing that's going to change. This needs to be uh, pretty much typed into the uh, your search engine and then just change whatever package name it is if you want to find it. So um, that's what I've done here is I've got the car package documentation in R. I've done that search and here is package car and it's cran.r-project.org. That's where you want to be. Nowhere else but CRAN. Okay. You might be, I take that back, git.hub might be another place where somebody's put the documentation, but usually it's under CRAN. Okay. And so here's the package car. It tells you when it was last modified, the version. And then you might think this has to do with automobiles, but you'd be incorrect. It's the companion to applied regression, C-A-R. So this package is all about regression not automobiles, okay? So um, it's a very handy package for um, doing some really nice uh, regression analysis. Okay, and so within this, um, it, here are all the functions that they created for us in alphabetical order. So a lot of different functions that we can use. So this is a very handy um, package to know. Okay. So once you've read that, um, then we can go and we can install the package. But first you may want to make sure that you want to see what packages have been installed. So install.packages is one way to do that. We don't have to do it this way. So this is a lot of lines of code. Look at all this. That's a lot to wade through. Okay. All right. What you can do is just come over here to this lower right pane, click on packages, and scroll through. Here they are. This is everything that's been installed. The ones that are checked have been loaded. Okay. All right. I'm going to get back to where car is if I can. There we go. The other way, the. No. Okay. So, not yet. So, we've got code, and then we've got the RStudio uh, graphical user interface or GUI, right? So to install a package, I do this in, I do put this in code. Notice that we have these quotations. If I want to install the car package, then I have to say install.packages and then in quotations car. If you don't put the quotations, it won't do it. So if I run this code, let's say installing the package, a little red stop sign shows up here, and then it says package car successfully unpacked and MD5 sums checked, and it tells you where the binary packages are here. So you're good. Now, in our studio, if we want to install a package, we just go up to Tools, 
install packages and I start typing in here C-A-R and there's the one I want make sure that this checkbox is selected and then you say install and there we go okay gives you the information now now that I have it installed it's still not okay so let me undo it. it's still not in, uh, loaded so I still can't use anything from there so to load it I say library car and again um, now you'll see that the car is checked and car data is checked that's a dependency yes I can come over here to packages and select them but that's not practical every time I run code I want to load the same packages so that my code runs so it's important for me to put those packages in my code okay so yes I can use the the check boxes but that's not really practical because I write code and then I give it to you I've checked my check boxes you don't know why it won't run okay so I, in my code, I do put install packages. I usually comment it out because you only need to do this once. Once it's installed, you don't need to install it again. But every time you run the code, every time you open up R, you will have to run, you will have to load up the car package. It will not be loaded. Okay? So that's why you need your library statements. All right? So pretty important stuff there. Now, to update packages, now, if I want to know which packages need to be uh, updated, I can run old.packages. And boy, there's a lot. They get updated all the time. So, you might think, wow, i got to do this all the time. No, you don't. You want to update packages when they put something new out or when they fix a mistake. But you've got to be careful. If you have a lot of code written with a certain version of the package, you may not want to update it um, because it may uh, change your code or make your code wrong or your code may not work anymore if they've done away with something. So uh, you, have to, you have to hope that the uh, owner of the package doesn't do something like that, but I have seen instances where, where you update the package and now it won't work, so you have to go back to an older version. Okay. In our studio, we just go to, it's a lot easier, tools, check for package updates. And then if we want to actually update the package, we, we select you know, desk tools and say install updates. Okay. I'm not going to do that. Well, actually I will. Here we go. So it's running down here. We see the stop sign taking a little bit. And there we go, it's done. So now, if I wanted to update all the packages, every package that needs updating, update.packages. Now, ask equals true means that for every single package that needs updating, it's going to ask me if I want to do it or not, yes or no. That's a lot of packages, so that would take forever. So that means I'd have to sit here. I could change it to ask equals false. Uh, so then it doesn't prompt me, um, and again, it's going to do them all. So that's why you see that I have commented out this code. I don't want to accidentally run it, or else I'll be stuck. Okay, So some dangerous code here, so to speak, that um, it can tie you up for a long time, so I'd be careful with that. So in the R GUI, I've already shown you tools, check for package updates, and I can select whichever ones I want, click install, we did that. Now, if you want to know more about packages, here's an online tutorial, so type that into your code along. Um, and then if I come over here, paste it, hit enter, now here's the nice tutorial about things you need to know. Okay. All right. Naming conventions. So, um, I'm not going to use the help. I'll just do this. So, little ANOVA, okay, it's a function, right? It doesn't tell you as much, does it? Because it's got, it, it's built into basic, so you can't see it. And then this ANOVA, um, almost the same thing. doesn't tell you much at all, but they're different. So if I come over here to help and I start typing 
little a, N-O-V-A, right? That's the stats package. Capital A in ANOVA, that's the car package, okay, which we just loaded. All right. Now, so, so this case sensitive, so a capital A and a little a completely different. In fact, if I analyze the same data set with both of these functions, I get different answers because they're doing a little different thing. So you've got to be really careful. So now let's talk about naming. The characters that you can use may be uh, determined by which operating system you're using, which is Unix, Windows, or Mac. But in general, you can use any letters and any numbers in the names of objects or files. Okay? So um, this is called alpha for alphabet and numeric for numbers. Oops. Okay. We also allow a period and the underscore in names. Okay, so names have to start with either a letter or a period. So you can start the name of an object with a period. I do not recommend that you do this. Here's why. Here's an example. So old dot old vec one. Look at my environment. It looks like it's empty. It says it's empty. But if I print out dot old vec one, it is there. 10, 20, 30. Now, if I get rid of the period and I change the values. Now it shows up. It does not like a period. So if a name starts with a period, then the second character cannot be a number. Let's see what happens if I um, type a 1 in here. It turns it blue. Now watch over here. Unexpected to, you get the red X, so it tells you there's an error. Okay. When I delete the 1, the error goes away. Okay. Name length. We're limited to 256 bytes. I think this means that a name can be 256 characters long, but I'm not exactly sure. Please don't quote me on it. But it's a pretty long name in either case. All right. So that's naming conventions. Something to know. All right. But not something that we... So once you get used to it, you don't think about it much. But... Um, but uh, I don't suggest you start your names with periods because, again, they won't show up in your environment. All right. Commands. So if I want multiple commands on one line, I can separate them by a semicolon. So if I do this, I ran that line, both of them are over here. Now, I could also separate them by a new line, so or oops, a new line. So you can either separate them by a semicolon or a line. So here is the first one, here is the second one. Or I can select and run both. Okay. Now, I've never seen an example of this, but uh, I saw that they had it. You can group elementary commands by um, inside these brackets now, or braces, they're called. So I guess one of the reasons you could do this is just to show that they're together. I don't know. But um, now, if I click up here, Notice that um, if the command's not complete at the end of the line, so let's say here, where I typed in this, the next line, it gave me this. And right now, it's giving me a caret for input, right? Input here. But look what happened here. Because it started, in the bracket, the brace actually was here, and the close brace wasn't on the same line, it gave me a plus sign. And then another plus sign to say that it hasn't finished yet. So do this and this and this together. And then it gave me the carrot. All right. So if a command's not completed on the same line, then um, if it flows over to the next line, then it will, uh, the R console will give you a plus sign to show that. Okay. Now, once I'm down here in the console, if I want to see a previous command, I use the up arrow. And there it is. It also includes your comments. So that's a little annoying, but uh, that, that's what happens. I did an up arrow again, and it brought me those two. Up arrow again, just to that one. Up arrow again to that one. So, and now I could run this, or I could come over here and 
modify it, and then hit enter to run. Okay, so it gives me the up. Okay, so you can you can call up previous commands in the console by using your arrow instead of having to scroll. Because look at how much scrolling. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Okay. Okay. Now using output file. Okay. So. One of the first things we need to know is what our working directory is. So get wd or get working directory. And it should be for you as well, the desktop, or I'm sorry, not desktop. Um, let's see. So I changed this. So the default should be documents if you're in Windows. And I don't know what it's called in Mac, but you'll have something similar. Now to set a working directory, we set WD and then inside the quotation marks, okay, so you have to have quotation marks, you have to have the path. The other thing is, if I come over here to documents and I click, uh, no, it doesn't do it there, does it? Uh, okay, this PC, uh, let me go to here, good. Now, Notice that I have backslashes. But in R, R won't read backslashes. You have to change all of those to forward slashes. Okay? So kind of annoying. I can copy and paste, and then I have to change all these slashes to, from backslashes to forward slashes for R to read it. Okay? So I'm going to change my working directory to the desktop. If you're on Mac, um, figure out what that is. And uh, now, I will tell you that when I come here and go to desktop and I click up here, it just says desktop, but I do know that that is under users in Leadbet for me. The same thing, it's desktop, but it just doesn't show it in that um, file explorer. Okay. So um, in your code long, I want you to change it to the equivalent of desktop. What desktop is, is it's this area here when you first go onto the computer. So that's where I want it, whether it's Mac or whether it's uh, Windows, okay? That's what I'm looking So change it to that. And then when we say get working directory, it tells me it's desktop. And then I'm going to set it back to where it was before, okay? It, so this will be important because we'll have some uh, assignments where you have to put something in your working directory and then read it. That way you don't have to um, do all of this with the... Uh, directory. I don't want, when I run your code, I don't want to have to modify your um, stuff here to find that file, um, you know, or have to change your code to get it to run. So we'll be using our working directory to, uh, to put files so that um, when you say load it, you don't have to do this file path because that can be very annoying when I'm grading uh, a bunch of different people's stuff. Very time consuming, not annoying, time consuming. Okay, it is annoying too. <laughs> All right. Um, executing a code file. So I have saved, um, I put this one of these last code files, code along files, in my working directory, the code along 3.r. And so I can just simply say source. Now watch what happens to my uh, directory here. Remember that when I run this, all of my files say clear the environment first, and then it runs it. So all of this stuff is going to go away. So everything that was over here is gone, but now everything that was created, all the objects created in that other file, have been saved here. And here are the output, all the output from all the commands in there, but I don't know what that is. Not without opening up that file. Okay, So here are my objects that have been put in there. Now, um, this was something that I didn't really um, know before, or actually I was told this when I first learned R, and then I ran into a situation where somebody wrote a function, and it spits out all this information every time you run the function. And I was running the function in a loop like 10,000 times and it was just filling up my console with all this stuff I didn't want to see. So I looked for a solution on how to stop it from doing that and it turns out that using this function sync was the uh, answer. Now it will create whatever file you say here. 
file name. Okay, and so I could put dot uh, txt maybe. Okay, and so divert all the output to that, so it won't show up down here. I'm gonna clear my console now. I run sync null.txt, and then I run vec1, vec1a, vec2. Nothing shows up out here. And then to get it back, to stop putting stuff to this null.txt, whatever file name you said there, you run sync with just the parentheses. Now, if I run this line, look what happens. It prints out all that stuff. Okay, so it's back to the console. Now we want to open up that file. Oops. And is this it? Uh, oh, it's it's not the right spot. I'm sorry. I'm going to run. I'm going to set this to um, desktop. That's what I wanted to do. And now I'm going to run this, this, this. Okay. Oops. Go back to desktop. And now I've got null.txt here. And if I open that up, maybe. Okay. Here are all the outputs. So it diverted all my output to this file. Okay. Now, objects. We've talked about objects. We've done a little bit with it. Now let's talk about it a little bit more. If I want to view the list of objects, well, in our studio, they're over here, except... Uh, Except if you start the name with a period. Let's see if we can get this one to show up. Okay. So now, even though it doesn't dot old vec doesn't show up over here, if I list out objects, it doesn't show up here either. So it's really a problem having a, a period. But if I say dot old vec um, one, it, it's it's in there because it will print out. But um, but there's uh, but it won't show up if I list it list the objects. So that's interesting. All right. And as I said in our studio, you can look over here in your panel. Okay. If I want to remove an object, I want to get rid of I. Then use rm i. Run that. I is gone. How about if I want to remove more than one thing? How about vec one and vec one a? Notice that I have to put them. Now here, if I just use one, I don't use quotes. But if I um, say more than one, I have to say list equals oops, C, and then I have to list each one of them in quotations with a comma in between. And then they're gone when I run that. Um, if I want to remove all in our studio, I can use the broom over here. Now they're all gone. Okay. Uh, Wish I hadn't done that. Okay, so let me um, run this again. Okay, put them back. Oops. Oops, I'm, I need to change my working directory. There we go. Back to where that was. All right. Now they're back in here. So um, so if I want to look at the structure of VEC2 STR, we've done that in the uh, intro to R for data camp. So it gives me the number that it's numeric. How many it is, and the actual, and starts listing out the values. Okay. History. Um, in our studio, there's a history tab right here, and I can see the history. In the R GUI or in command, I can hit history here, and it will take you right up here to the console, to the history console. Okay, so it's not going to print it out in the console here. It's going to take us to this. Tab. So if I go here and I say control C, it takes me right back to this history tab in our studio. Okay, that's plenty, and that's it for this uh, video. I hope this has been informative. I hope you will keep this uh, file somewhere where you can uh, refer to it. So if you have a question about some of these basics, you'll be able to find it quickly. Please take care of yourself and stay safe because we want to see you here next time.